Crowds of funny things. Crowd can turn on you uh, just by a, a few words. The psychology of a crowd turning into a mob has been written about a lot of times. Unfortunately, we've seen even the election process this year turn into violence at times. What is it that changes a crowd from the first part of our liturgy to the liturgy now? The first part of the liturgy, the crowd was exultant with welcome for Christ, singing and saying, Hosanna in the highest, welcome to the King, the Son of David. There was exultation and welcome and all kinds of real uh, adulation and adoration for this man. A few days later, they're calling for his blood. Crucify him. Destroy him. The same crowd. The same people. And we could just say, well, then it's just a story, but it's not a story. It actually happened. And we have seen in the news and in other ways crowds that have come become mobs. And the kind of violence a mob is able to do when rationally persons would not do it on their own. But once the crowd gets going, once the emotions get stirred, once that collective anger begins to surface, watch out. Terrible things can happen. That movement from the, the adulation of the crowd on Palm Sunday to the cries of violence on Good Friday is really, in a sense, it's a parable of our mixed reaction to the Lord. We are that crowd. And some days it is very much Hosanna. But that can easily turn into crucify him. Not, not in those particular words. The way, we, uh, the way we put the Lord to the side and say, you just stand over there. When I need you, I'll ask you to, but just don't involve yourself in my life. Don't become part of just stay there. I'll tell you when I need you. That's not exactly crucify him, but since he is the Son of God, our Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sanctifier, the reason for our existence, the Alpha and Omega of life, by putting him to the side, it's a form of crucifixion. We both recognize and deny at the same time, based on circumstances. Words are cheap. Feelings come and go. One day you, you feel like you want to become a saint. The next day, the smallest temptation drives you to sin. We are all have this two-faced quality within us. We are like the protagonists in this gospel, certainly like the crowd, but also like individuals in there. Peter, very fascinating character, very strong about being for Jesus, so much so that he takes out a sword and wants to be a hero in the garden until Jesus says, stop it. It's not what we're about. He said to Jesus, I will do anything for you. And Jesus says, no, you won't. He knew Peter. And when it came down to real tension, real decision, when Peter had to step up and really accept and testify to his faith in Jesus, it didn't work. He was frightened. He was frightened into denying our Lord, denying that he even knew him. I don't know if you've ever had that experience of denial. I had this 
strange experience with my dad. Not that my dad consciously denied me, but it was a strange feeling. My dad got Alzheimer's, and we didn't know what it was at first, and we went to a neurologist, and the neurologist said to my father, pointing to me, he says, who is that? I can't tell you how my blood ran cold when my father struggled looking at me and unable to recognize me. I understand it was an illness, but at the same time, to be denied, to be negated, is a profound, especially by someone you love and loves you, it's a profoundly painful experience. And it says in the, in the gospel we just read that right after he denied it, maybe it was Jesus was being passed from one portico to another, from one courtroom to another. Perhaps he was already being beaten and mis, mis, mishandled. But it says that right after Peter said, I don't know him, he turned and looked at Peter. It's the only gospel that mentions that. He turned and looked at Peter. And I always wondered, what kind of a look was that? Was it a look of, I told you so? Was it a look of, would you, you really did that, Peter? Was it a look of shame? Was it a look of anger at Peter? I don't think so. I think it was a look of compassion, a look of understanding, a look that said, I know, Peter. I know. I know that you do love me. I know you failed it. You know, the difference between Peter and Judas is that Judas despaired and killed himself. If, Jesus, if Judas had gone to the crucifixion and said to Jesus, forgive me, he would have been forgiven. He would have been taken right back. Look what happened to Peter. Peter saw him at the res after the resurrection. And what did Jesus say to him? Three times he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter said, yes, Lord. Even being upset with him on the third time, you know that I love you. You know that I'm a mess. You know that I, I, I can't be depended on. You know I, I'm... I'm I'm not what I should be, but you know I try. You know I love you. And Peter was once again made the prince of the apostles. Judas could have been the same way. The difference between Peter and Judas is that Judas did not have hope and confidence in that love that Jesus had for him. He could have been forgiven, but he chose not to ask. He didn't feel that he could ever make up what he did. We could find ourselves in very many ways, in the kaleidoscope of people in this gospel. We can find ourselves in many ways. Do we truly and firmly believe that no matter what we do, the love of Jesus is for us? that all we need to do is turn our minds and hearts to him and, 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 and beckon to him to come out of the corner of our lives and to sit in the center of our lives, to be there with us, that Jesus is not going to say, no, you didn't want me then, I'm not going to move now. He's not, gonna, he's not that kind. He's the son of God. He's the king. He's the Lord. He is love itself. And no matter how brusque we have been with him, no matter how dismissive we are of him, that all we need to do is turn to him and say, please forgive me. But that's the problem. Sometimes we don't do that. It does, it's not automatic. Judas didn't do it. 
He could have, but he didn't do it. He ended up killing himself in despair. We have to go to Jesus. What better time than this week, Holy Week? We have to go to Jesus and say, I want you to be the center of my life. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I know that I have sinned. I know that I have betrayed you. I know that I have negated be knowing you. I know I've put you in the corners of my life. But I am sorry for that. And I'll never do it again. And even if I do do it again, you will still have me back. As long as I have those words, please forgive me. That requires a lot of humility. Peter cried all during that, that weekend till the resurrection. He cried, it said he bitterly, he cried. He felt his own betrayal. He felt lousy about what he did and what, what he had become. And he was willing to go to the Lord and look for that opportunity. That's why when they said the tomb was empty, he was running. He wanted to see him again. He wanted to say, I'm sorry. I do love you, Lord. So we pray today, as we gather together at Eucharist on Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, we, we, we come to the Lord cognizant of the fact that we have two faces and that we need to heal that division within ourselves. We need to go out and to become like Christ. Actions speak louder than words. Actions create our future. It is only when we act and decide to act and actually perform the works of God that we have truly made the change, turn that corner. Look at Jesus on the cross, again in Luke, praying for those who crucified him. The only person that was canonized by the words of Jesus was this thief who said himself he was guilty of murder, of thievery. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because that thief had compassion on Jesus. The only place in the gospel where Jesus is not referred to by anybody as Lord or Master or Rabbi, he just says, Jesus, remember me when they come into your kingdom. He had compassion on Jesus. Maybe he didn't even believe it. But he knew that Jesus needed someone to reach out to him. And because of that one act of compassion, a lifetime of bad will and sin was washed away. Today you will be with me in paradise. My brothers and sisters, we have lots of things to heal, lots of relationships to deal with. We have resentments in our hearts. We have people we don't talk to. We have people we look down on. We have uh, ways that we are inauthentic to ourselves and to others. Holy Week is a wonderful time to turn, to turn, to convert. Not to be a Holy Joe, but to really truly turn our lives around to make them more like Christ by action and not by words. Let us pray at this Eucharist that we might have the courage and the insight to say yes to the call of Christ who wishes to bring us into the paradise of his fellowship today, now, if we want to. May Jesus Christ be praised both now and forever. Amen.